The Willamette River Valley is home to most of Oregon's citizens and a center of Oregon's economy. Its landscape is also a riverscape. The Willamette River ties together forested uplands, fertile agricultural lowlands, and fast-growing urban areas, including Eugene and Portland. It provides habitat for salmon and steelhead as they migrate to and from the North Pacific Ocean. It is a major tributary in the Columbia Basin, which drains much of the Pacific Northwest. The valley is about 180 miles long and 100 miles wide, encompassing just under 12,000 square miles. Its formation began millions of years ago when collisions of tectonic plates and volcanic eruptions formed the coast in Cascade Ranges. These mountains now cradle the valley and support abundant forests important to Oregon's timber industry. Over 15,000 years ago, the valley began to fill with sediment left by major floods of the Columbia River, catastrophic by today's standards. Ice dams formed huge lakes in western Montana. Repeatedly over millennia, these ice dams collapsed, releasing enormous loads of water, ice, rock, and sediments down the Columbia and up into what is today the Willamette Valley. Later, these lake sediments were covered by alluvium, deposited during Willamette River flooding events. Today, these soils provide some of the best lands for agricultural production in Oregon. Farmers in the valley lead the world in rye grass seed and bushberry production, contributing to the culture and economy of the valley. Only 150 years ago, the river was a complex network of primary channels, side channels, and backwater areas. During winter floods, the river spread out over the lowlands, inundating over 300,000 acres of the valley. The Willamette is a managed river. Eleven major reservoirs on tributaries to the river control floodwaters, provide irrigation water, and power. These dams and other river controls have altered the system's natural hydrology and brought about some significant changes. The effects on the river include increased bank erosion, loss of riparian areas, and decreased native fish populations. Indeed, 30% of native fish species are endangered, threatened, or sensitive. With the area's projected growth trends, the pressure on the Willamette River and its watershed will only increase. As in other areas of the country, development outside of urban boundaries places a huge footprint on the land. Scientists, planners, and land managers are exploring new ways to consider the health of the watershed while still meeting the expanding demands of society. Salmon play a major role in the economy, politics, and culture of the Willamette Valley, as they do in all of the Pacific Northwest. The status of their populations is an effective indicator of the health of the landscape. Over the last century, populations of Pacific salmon species have declined dramatically throughout their ranges in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. The habitats of these fish uh, extend all the way from the cold water streams of Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, British Columbia, and Alaska. So it includes those freshwater streams, the rivers that these streams run into, the estuaries that the rivers run into before they meet the sea, and the North Pacific Ocean. It's a huge area of almost one and a half million square miles. Well, because the life history stages of salmon are so far reaching and cover such a broad area, the management of their their populations and their habitats is as complex as their life cycles are. Management issues traverse international boundaries, state and federal boundaries, private land and federal land boundaries, and socioeconomic realities of dealing with all of these complexities. There are a number of uh, significant anadromous fish issues associated with our watersheds. Um, uh, the, uh, the historic runs of salmon and steelhead on these streams are, of course, well known, and, and with all of the impacts over the years, um, the, the fish are struggling in a number of ways, and so much of the work here is associated with water quality and restoring habitat so that the, the salmon and steelhead will be able to survive. Practices within the watershed, not only adjacent to the river, but on the uplands of, above the river, that can affect water quality and therefore habitat include uh, grazing practices. There should be a good 
wide buffer of riparian vegetation, riparian forest vegetation in the case of the Willamette Valley to protect the river, the riparian ecology and the processes that happen between the river and the land to protect not only the river but the uplands as well. We're finding more and more that restoring ecological processes is much more effective at restoring salmon populations and water quality for humans than putting band-aids on rivers to keep them from flooding. Different uh, species of Pacific salmon have used these uh, watersheds in the Willamette Basin and all over the Pacific Northwest for hundreds of thousands of years and they have withstood drought and floods and fires and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and they have persisted through all that time and now they are faced with the, the challenges of what humans, human impacts and land use impacts have placed on them. And they are an indicator of the resilience and the sustainability of an entire landscape. So for that reason alone, we think they are probably w well worth uh, protecting and, um, and their watersheds are worth protecting. The salmon are a wonderful icon and something that can motivate us and give us a sort of a visual uh, historical center, perhaps. But it's overdone in the sense that the salmon are just part of a complex ecosystem. It's a great icon, but somehow we have to get our nose out of the river and look to the sides. Throughout the valley, progress is being made in improving the overall health of the watershed. John Miller truly sees the big picture when reading landscapes. His work spans the globe in the area of watershed restoration. In the Willamette Valley, he is involved in sustainable housing developments, a native plant nursery, and long-term planning initiatives. In a public sense, I'm involved in several volunteer efforts, and in a private sense, we have several companies that are focused upon Willamette activities uh, or related activities. We have Mahonia Vineyards and Nursery, which is a uh, nursery which produces native plants and grapevines and grass grapevines and then Wildwood is an urban design and development firm that does uh, urban developments and we try to make both of those operations uh, adhere to, to sustainable principles. I think too often we tend to separate our activities into sort of identifiable spheres and, and not look at them as a whole and in this case, we're sitting in an urban development um, and it's adjacent to an agricultural operation as well. And the responsibility is on both of those operations to uh, act responsibly and sustainably. It's a black twinberry. Growing native plants um, and using them in the landscape has lots of benefits. You don't have to use as much water generally. Uh, you don't have to use as much in the way of pesticides or herbicides. They don't take much maintenance because they grow fine as they are. It's a little more unruly looking in some cases, but I think that's part of the charm. Well, this is a Chardonnay vine, and it's grafted onto a rootstock that is naturally resistant to the root weevil that kills grapevines. In the public arena, in 1996, Governor Kitzhaber asked me to chair his Willamette Basin Task Force, which was a group, a very diverse group of folks, including farmers and foresters and urban planners and government folks, uh, conservation groups. And we basically looked at the, at the Willamette Basin and said, how do we deal with the uh, health of the watershed? And we very carefully de defined watershed as from ridge top to ridge top, not just the water between the banks. And we came up with about three basic principles, which uh, include looking at the watershed as a whole, acting as a community instead of 110 separate jurisdictions in the basin, and also having a strategic framework to guide future actions. Miller realizes the complexity of sustaining the health of landscapes. He also understands the future of this valley hinges on tackling the biggest issue of all, growth. Today, things have changed so much. Uh, farming is in a 
in a decline, at least as we know it. And I'm afraid that's a trend, not a cycle. And so here we are with this huge growth looking at the valley in the face, probably a doubling in the next 40 years. And it's going to be hard enough to accommodate that gracefully with the laws we have. But the real problem is going to be the economics. If you can't farm farmland economically, it's going to be much more attractive for urban development. So the sprawl, in theory, can get worse. And there'll be a lot of pressure, pressure at a level we've never known before in the valley to eat up farmland and forest land for cities. If we're going to change the form of our cities and our farms and our forests, we're going to have to listen to nature and use scientific data and change people's habits and do a whole bunch of stuff that is not always going to be predictable when it comes together. Learning about that process takes a great deal of commitment, time, and vision. To help crystallize that vision and provide accurate and clear information for decision makers, scientists have turned to digital technology. Stream ecologists Stan Gregory and landscape architect David Hulse are working together to create a virtual time machine fueled by historical and derived data. This new tool allows decision makers and citizens to see the changes that have occurred in the Willamette Valley. Vegetation data collected by land surveyors in the 1850s were programmed into mapping software. Then Hulse was able to accurately simulate the past in a virtual flyover of the valley as it was 150 years ago. It was a much more complex system than today. The river's many channels overflowed into the lowlands during the annual winter rains, exchanging nutrients with the land. These floods also distributed sediments in the river and renewed wetlands and riparian forests with native seedlings. Floodwaters felled riparian trees and carried them in haphazard fashion to the channels and floodplains. There, they became habitat for fish and other aquatic life. Calmer water in sloughs and side channels served as refuge for fish and curbed the erosive power of the faster moving water in the main channels. Mixed forests of trees and shrubs frame the channels, providing important habitat for wildlife. Wetlands and oak savannas added diversity to the valley's habitats. Go. Then Hulse turns the dials to the future and creates three visions of what this valley could become under plausible scenarios crafted by local stakeholders. For example, the conservation scenario places greater emphasis on ecosystem protection and restoration, while reflecting a reasonable balance between ecological, cultural, and economic considerations. The differences are subtle, yet important in terms of the watershed's health. So what we see in the conservation scenario is that we are not envisioning a return to mid-19th century conditions. What instead the conservation scenario is representing is a version of the future in which many of the ecological functions of the river that have been lost could be regained while simultaneously allowing people to still get economic returns from the lands they own and manage. These scenarios are intended to give Oregonians a unique perspective on which to base their land use decisions. Decisions that will bring about the future they want rather than the future they get. Currently, some elements of that old meandering river are closer to being restored. The Willamette needs room to move, but that need must take into account the landowners directly influenced by the river. This site represents one of the challenges of the interaction of riverine systems and human property values. Rivers are dynamic. Their channels are constantly changing as they erode material at one place and deposit it at another. This provides critical habitats and provides nutrient exchange, food resources. It's a very important part of the way that rivers maintain their health, but it obviously creates huge problems for property owners. This is a site that was flooded in the flood of 1996 and the Willamette River cut a new channel through its floodplain, creating again, as we see, complex habitat, large wood, shallow habitat, deep habitat, fast water, slow water, and refuge in future floods. And so this is an important property of the river system. But how do landowners cope with this kind of channel change that cuts through their production property? One of the concepts that has been explored is the concept of meander corridors. 
in which incentive systems, rental agreements, leases, property easements are used to allow the landowners to obtain resources or funds from their land, but dedicate it to dynamics of riverine systems and allow rivers to function naturally. This also can be coupled to the hydrologic restoration of rivers, where we allow rivers to flood more and try not to control them quite as much. But this requires that the landowners be willing to accept the changes that are bound to occur during those floods. But this allows the river to come up, to overbank onto its floodplains, and then to drop rapidly back into its channels. Quite different than the process that we see with flood control, where quite often these rivers are maintained within bankful conditions for long periods of time, with the channel eroding constantly right on that one confined bank, and it's staying at flood flow for one to two weeks, whereas normally it might come down in three to four days. So the approaches that we've talked about would allow for more dynamic channels in the river system and allow for restoration of floodplain forest to interact with those more dynamic channels. Many landowners are reinventing how they work the land. They're trying new ideas and sometimes discarding the practices of the past to create a more sustainable future. The Willamette Valley has some of the richest farmland in the world and Bill Chambers owns a piece of it. How he and his family have chosen to farm illustrates how alternative, sustainable practices can compete in the local marketplace. Our farm is uh, located here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, we're right in the floodplain. The river is just behind me here. The business is a row crop farming operation and then also a food processing facility where we take the crops that we grow and process them and freeze them uh, with the idea being that uh, we minimize the amount of uh, energy used to transport the products to a processing facility. Any of the waste that is produced as part of the food processing uh, stays on the farm. We use the, the wastewater for irrigation and then any of the, the processing waste is collected and either uh, turned into compost and spread back out on the farm or we uh, send that to a feedlot where it's used for feeding cattle and then we take that waste, the, the cattle waste, compost it and bring it back to the farm here as, as nutrients. So we're trying to uh, cycle nutrients in as big a circle uh, as we possibly can. For us the soil is not just a mineral sponge where we're putting in and taking out nutrients but it's actually an ecosystem where we're, we're putting in the dominant species but we have to, to manage and take care of the other uh, species in the soil that's, that's part of that ecosystem. Well, one of the things that we're doing is trying to uh, minimize the amount of tillage. Organic matter is very important to our growing crops. It's where all of the nutrient reactions occur between the plant and the soil is through the organic matter. So we're trying to preserve that. And what we found is that tillage tends to combust or burn that because it, it brings it, uh, exposes the organic matter to more oxygen and uh, over time the organic matter uh, in the soil declines. As an example of some of the uh, alternatives that we use besides pesticides is uh, planting cilantro in with our uh, cauliflower and broccoli. It's there to attract predatory insects to the field. It's a predator-prey relationship and you have to uh, uh, keep the predators healthy for them to keep the prey under control. We still have small pockets of, of insects that cause us problems, but uh, we balance the cost of the uh, insecticide against the damage that they do, and we're so far ahead because of the savings on pesticides uh, that uh, we can live with some patches where the, the, the uh, soil pests get ahead of the, the, uh, the predators, but it doesn't happen uh, very long. Further away from the river, nestled in the foothills of the Oregon Coast Range, the Buchanan Century Farm is home to Taiyi wine cellars. Its rich soils and moderate cool climate have been likened to the great wine growing region of Burgundy, France. They are well known for their award winning Pinot Noir, and they are also well known for their awareness and sensitivity to the local landscape. 
Uh, the Willamette River Valley at one time had large runs of salmon and steelhead and, and lots of wild cutthroat trout. Um, over the years, some of those runs have dwindled and uh, farmers in the valley are trying to, uh, with different programs, trying to enhance or restore some of those salmon and steelhead and those cutthroat populations. Uh, we at uh, Taiyi Wine Cellars are, are trying to do our part by um, actually becoming a, enrolling in a program called Salmon Safe. And what we're doing is planting, um, uh, in fact, I'll show you here, uh, there's some tall grass here. Um, that we've got right along the side. We used to spray Roundup right, right in the rows. We always mowed the uh, aisleways, but the actual rows, uh, we used to just have bare ground because of Roundup. And uh, we've planted a, uh, it's a, it's actually a hard fescue, and it's a fairly low growing grass, and it uh, creates a nice carpet so the weeds don't uh, take over. But at the same time, it, uh, uh, keeps all the soil on the hillside, and a lot of grapes are grown on some pretty, pretty uh, steep hillsides. And uh, by having this grass here, the actual uh, uh, soil stays on the hillsides where it belongs, so it's good for the farmer. Uh, it also uh, doesn't go into the stream. If, if you get sediment or soil in the stream, you're going to have problems with the gills of the, the uh, rearing fish. Uh, you also have problems with um, spawning areas, uh, some of the gravel will get covered and uh, plugged up with sediment, and, and so that's a problem. So in a sense, by doing this, uh, we're helping the salmon, we're helping our farm, uh, and it's a marketing tool because we can uh, put on our wine bottles that we are salmon safe. They encourage winery visitors to enjoy the natural beauty of their farm along a nature trail that winds through their native valley wetland and woodland habitats. Uh, my family has had a heritage of uh, stewardship really for over 100 years because they've kept uh, over 100 acres of native woods uh, along the creek and protected those native woods. The, having the, the trees right next to the stream will cool those streams. So we're planting a lot of native trees such as ash, uh, uh, some local ponderosa pine that's Willamette ponderosa pine, uh, some native cottonwoods. Some people might think I'm a little crazy to get out there and plant trees, but planting trees really gives me pleasure. And uh, in addition to that, it, it's kind of a form of life after death because in a sense you know that those trees are going to be there long after you're pushing up daisies. On the Buchanan farm, the stewardship lessons of the generations have not been lost. My dad died in 1968, but I think he'd be pretty happy uh, now uh, with this wetland reserve program that we've set up because one of the things we're doing is the original meander. We're going back to that original meander. So we're going to take out the straightened part of the stream and have the stream go back to the original meander. And that's something I think he'd be proud of. And I have a real hope that uh, my daughter will be the fifth generation on the farm and my son too, but I think my daughter has more interest in it. Uh, I just have a hope that she'll continue that heritage and she has a big strong interest right now in uh, sustainability, uh, in uh, protecting fa small farms and, and I, it's going to be exciting to see that uh, continue. At the Gar Farm, bed and breakfast guests could wander miles of trails through forests, meadows and restored native wetlands. The farm demonstrates land management strategies that restore and enhance the natural habitat. Rob Tracy of the NRCS worked closely with the Gar family throughout this restoration. Ted and Harriet's interests are very broad, uh, uh, primarily associated with ecological function and creating habitat that has been lost in the Willamette Valley. So the, this is quite a unique property in that uh, Ted and Harriet's property runs from the ridge, which is uh, heavily forested, um, down across uh, foothill actually to the creek and the wetlands associated with the creek and that riparian corridor. So we essentially have almost an individual watershed, which gives us the opportunity to work with a number of plant communities and land uses, as well as um, kind of uh, model a larger watershed. In changing our focus and uh, actually our management, we've turned towards uh, natural habitat. Our interest included the plants and recovery of native plants in the area, and we just 
let the wetlands recover on their own and we found that there was a great uh, diversity of seeds in the seed bank that, that have been here for a number of years. This place has been farmed since uh, European settlement and, and it ha had been drained with a tile drainage system and chemicals and, and uh, monoculture cropping uh, that we know of uh, intensively for 40 years. So these seeds seem to have uh, been ready for the situation. I guess somebody said, build it and then we'll come or something like that. Well, it's kind of the, the way it was here. We found that the uplands were as equally or more important than even the water. And so that inspired us to do some upland ponds. And uh, we uh, have taken wet spots on the hills and created uh, intermittent ponds that actually are used by tree frogs and red-legged frogs have been found up there. You see them on a hot day uh, jump in when you walk beside some of these ponds. A few of them hold water throughout the year and so we think those are kind of heat refuge spots and so we felt that enhancing the uplands for amphibians was real helpful to them. Landscapes include our backyards and our backyards influence landscapes. Even small-scale projects can make a difference. Home to their family business, the Purse property demonstrates an energetic vision for restoration of a natural wetland. Their investment of time and energy led to an appreciation of the abundance of wildlife that are dependent on wetland habitat. So this project got going because we recognized that the field should have been wet and we wanted to make it wetter. The, the place was right and that it was a sp really specific soil type that holds moisture in a way you can't imagine. Just a little bit of water and you get a puddle. It does not drain. Now, after a while you figure out what works and we've had lots of success with ash. We're having good success with maple trees, some spruce, and willow. Lots and lots of willow. There's something about restoring a place to wet that's pretty exciting because water changes the character of your property a lot. As the river flows through time, the Willamette Valley is ever-changing. The forces of nature and those of humans are all connected in determining what the valley becomes. The challenges here seem daunting, but through collaboration and a new understanding of this complex system we call a watershed, we are more likely to sustain its people, natural resources, and landscape. We try not to farm with a formula. We try to have our eyes open all the time and say, well, how could we make this better? What is the best way uh, to do that? The real key to all of these efforts is doing something on the ground, actually changing our habits that results in changes in the landscape. We just have the ethic that uh, we're stewards here on this piece of piece of ground that uh, we want to leave it in a better condition than when we found it and when we uh, started farming here. <laughs>